borrow from the authors that are presenting writerly decisions or decisions related to illustrations and layout. And you have a lot of exemplar pieces of writing available for students so that they can see what other second graders or what other third graders are producing. And so I'm going to go back and revisit environment, but I don't think that you can get to independence without having, having an environment that speaks to children but also without them feeling like they're equipped with a toolbox. And part of your instruction is adding tools to their toolbox. And though there's a narrative toolbox, there's an informational toolbox, and there's an opinion argumentative toolbox. And so in my teaching, I use the phrase toolbox. Please don't think that you have to, but I physically make toolboxes for students in order for them to get to that level of independence. When I was in kindergarten, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I washed out milk cartons. I made them into toolboxes. Every time we learned a new craft technique or a new layout, we used popsicle sticks and we had icons at the end so that I can quickly say, as a form of assessment, what are we using today to support ourselves as a writer? That stem, that metacognitive stem of what are you using today to support yourself as a reader or what are you using today to support yourself as a writer? If there's anything at all that you could walk away with today, that is critical. And if you only used that STEM for the whole year, what are you using to support yourself as a writer today? You are giving your students a gift because you're having them slow down to think about their own thinking, to think about their process, and to think about what it is that they're going to emulate from these wonderful mentor texts. And that word emulate, I use it in kindergarten, I use it in fifth grade, it's a great tier three word. I break it down and I say, Jonathan London is going to be so thrilled that you're borrowing one of his tools, one of his techniques. If Jonathan walked into the classroom right now, he'd give you a hug because it's like, it's such a sense of pride that you want to borrow something from him. So I think of independence. I think about the word purpose, but I also think about the word audience. There are two really important words in writer's workshop, regardless of the resource that you use. Purpose and audience. If children are not clear on purpose and they think the only reason why they are writing is because their teacher told them to, we don't land in a good place. And so children need to know purpose. What is that? What does that look like and sound like in narrative? That also helps them to establish a criteria in their mind when they're selecting their writing ideas. If they're not in the right lane and they're not clear on purpose, sometimes they choose ideas that have them bounce in and out of the text types that we're trying to have them gain experiences in. Audience, also really important. Audience can't always be you. Most of your students think when they write, it's for who? The teacher. The audience is not always you. You may look at it, you may confer with them about it, but if you have a really reluctant writer in fourth grade who's learning all about informational text types, sometimes you can say, rename their audience, you're gonna make a picture, a nonfiction picture book for second grade. They're still experiencing the fourth grade standards. They're still experiencing what it means to emulate off of mentor authors. But when you reframe the audience, all of a sudden that writer is going to think about visual sources. My audience is second grade. So not only am I doing research, but I'm also including some illustrations or some clip art or some digital supports that help them go through the process. So when you're sharing with your, with your teachers, I would share the word, your goal is to get children to operate at a level of independence, to feel like they're equipped with a toolbox. I would share the importance of the words purpose and audience. And then I would also share, if they're not using it already, the phrase reading like a writer. That phrase is the cornerstone of your read alouds. And if your teachers do not have experience, this is an oldie but a goodie. Katie Wood Ray, she is the one that I wanna say has the corner market on the phrase reading like a writer. She doesn't present anymore, which literally breaks my heart because when she did, I held on to her every word. So this book in alliteration is called Wondrous Words. It gives teachers really good schema for what it means to read like a writer, 
like, well, I know some craft techniques, but I'm not sure I know all of them. Um, we've provided almost like a cheat sheet for you. And so you will have a document, not today, of all different craft techniques that's almost like a synthesis of what's in here. I brought along another book. This is actually more recent. It's called Writing with Mentors. If you want later on, sometimes you can just snap pictures of the covers. That kind of helps activate your schema. But this is how to reach every writer in the room using current engaging mentor texts. That's really what you're going to be doing. And the author of this book is Allison Marchetti, M-A-R-C-H-E-T-T-I. Um, making decisions about writing is often daunting for some students. Sometimes they seek your um, like affirmation from you. Is this okay? Is this okay for me to write about this? And what you want to do is get children to a place where they don't pose that question, or if they do, it's to a friend in the classroom. And so that they learn like the importance of talk and conversation as it lives in writer's workshop. These books are going to be coaches. When I hold up a mentor text for kids, I talk about them like they're my best friend. I'm on a first name basis with each author. So if I'm holding up a book of Donald Cruz, I'm like, so Donald is going to teach us about how to look at illustrations through perspective, because that's one of the gifts that he gives all his, all his readers in books. And so they're my friends, and they're my coaches, and my coaches, and they're my partner teacher. So I, I often say, oh, I would love to have Mo Willems here with me today, boys and girls. Mo couldn't come, but he's really here with us in our books. And the techniques that he's showing us are things that you could borrow from him. And then finally, the word community, because what you're establishing in workshop, the end goal, is that you have a community that speaks to your students, where they feel nurtured and supported from you, from their classmates, and from their environment. So writing fundamentals are units of study that are built with a binder, a series of lessons, and mentor texts. If I did a quick compare and contrast, and this is not on your handout, but this is important for you to know, your How Writers Work unit is shorter and has fewer mentor texts than the second unit that you have. So How Writers Work has five mentor texts and fewer lessons. And so the one thing that I should say is I almost call this like a published light unit. And the reason why I say that is you're not going to see multiple lessons per stage of the writing process. You're not taking a deep dive into process, but instead, the, the primary purpose of how writers work is to set up your classroom environment, to establish routines in some grade levels, to build an understanding about why we use a writer's notebook using Ralph Fletcher's work. Um, in K and one, it's to talk about why we use a folder and what goes in that folder. And so you can use how writers work as an opportunity to establish routines and rituals that probably will provide support in other times of the day as well. The one thing that I'm going to offer with how writers work is also sometimes the architects that designed classrooms did not think like a teacher. Does anyone have that experience when you walk into your room? I know sometimes with me, like there's an outlet here and there's an outlet there, and then you have to figure it out. And sometimes even where bulletin boards are, and, and I'll speak eloquently about the efficacy of anchor charts. In how writers work, it's going to speak a lot about anchor charts. And these charts, sometimes can't be housed prominently because of the design
choice? Where are my eyes drawn to in the classroom as a writer? Having an environment that speaks to kids, getting them acclimated with the word craft, with words purpose and audience, with what does a writer do, what does an illustrator do, and any other routines that you want to have in place, like we come to the gathering area. Do you all have like a gathering area in your classrooms? And when we come to the gathering area, if I had a chair here, this would be my pretend chair, we don't do something called the lean-in. You know what that is? So some of us have a chair here and an easel here, and we say turn and talk, and then what happens? Mm -hmm. We lean in, right? And so what your kids need to know from the first unit, and I'm not saying you do that, is that workshop teaching affords you exercise. Because when you say turn and talk during a lesson, you are going to go around like this, and here's the exercise part, right? So when you're in the classroom with little ones, you are scooping up brilliance from every child. And the kids need to know that. They need to know, because then talk turns to accountable talk. If they don't realize that you're going to go around, and I, I borrow this phrase from Ralph Fletcher, scooping up brilliance, they need to know that they're not talking about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch that they're talking about whatever it is that you ask them. And so the predictability of whatever routines you have related to the gathering area has to be crystal clear. So I'm so structured in my workshop, your students don't show up on the first day of school and, and do this. They don't say, I operate best with a lot of structure, right? The, the kids don't necessarily say that, but what do we know about kids? They need structure. They just don't know how to articulate that. So. Not only do I have carpet spots and turn and talk partners that change across the year, but I let them know, like I'm going around, I'm so interested in what you have to say, I keep a sticky note or a clipboard in my hand, I'm writing things down because that, and I don't, it doesn't matter to me what you're writing down, but the kids need to see you writing something down. And then I let them know, I'm gonna be calling on three partnerships to share, like that's how clear I am. I don't want the kids to be wondering, so the predictability of workshop is a security blanket for students. And so part of how writers work is building in that predictability. So let me just stop right there for a moment. Thoughts. Anything that I just said this morning that either gave you an affirmation or a thing to think about? Do you have an example of the author posted? Yep. I do. There's going to be like five examples from this presentation. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm collapsing my presentation right now because that's going to be my enemy today. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And at Low Light and UCLA, we have reading partners, mm -hmm. and our reading partners be separate from our writing partners. So that's teacher preference. You know, sometimes the way that I get to know my partnerships is very different in reading than it might be in writing. So sometimes in reading, it has to do with the genre that I'm teaching. I have two children that like are really passionate about nonfiction, so my rationale for putting those partners together might be related to my teaching. And in writing, it might be in the middle of the year, I have kids that are like flying with craft techniques. So I think that you're gonna make individual decisions, but they change. Yeah. Um, some teachers change in the middle of the unit, so it might be after the first five um, interactive read aloud lessons, the immersion phase of the unit. They might stop and then change them as they move into mini lessons, or some teachers keep them intact across the whole time of study. Anyone else? Okay, skipping that. You saw this already. Um, if I did like a quick, really brief talk off of each one of these, this is your launch unit, aka how writers work. Shorter, fewer lessons, five books. The rest of these units have 10 mentor texts and many more lessons. So also in comparison of how long does this take, um, generally this unit, and I know you have a curriculum now, uh, it takes about four or five weeks, but it takes as long as it takes because you want children to have opportunities to practice their routines. These units a little bit longer, and so usually there's a window, and I, I noticed that you kind of have windows, like this one, it's four to six weeks. The reason why you see like similar titles, I don't want you to think they're carbon copy units. These units, before the standards came out, like Lucy, we had grade span units, so it was like a K1 unit, a 2-3 unit. Then the standards came out and we had to write units that align specifically to standards. And so you will see a scaffold from this personal narrative experience to this one, just like you're going to see
and you're like, oh, look at all these books that I've got. Unfortunately, uh, we have a deliverer of bad news, I guess. And the, the unit itself comes in shrink wrap like this. And then you get divider pages like this. This is the unfortunate part. You have to go through the lessons to stick in the divider pages because the mini lessons are divided by stage of the writing process. What's also nice about the divider pages is they're not just meant for organization. On each one of these, there are two columns that really speaks about what is the teacher's role during immersion and what are the students doing. And so for each stage of the writing process, this information is for you. Not a bad idea to share it with parents as well if they don't understand writing as a process. Some parents understand writing as a product or shifting um, this information is really, really valuable. So I will tell you that this wasn't meant to give you more time. It's, it, meant, it was meant so that you see these and you're like, oh, these look interesting. I'm going to read through these. And then you'll divide up your lessons and then it's um, neatly organized. And so that will be very exciting when you get these boxes. It, it's housed in a box like this or a box like this. You don't have to keep them there. You're going to get a series of labels in it that some teachers, you'll see me, I just use markers. Some teachers put a label here because all your binders look the same. But the labels are also to put on the mentor texts. You know how sometimes the books get lost in your classroom library? And so when you get your mentor text, you're gonna make a decision about where to put these stickers. I generally, I'm, and it depends on where I'm working. I put them on the barcode because then I'm not blocking anything out. There's such valuable things on these mentor texts that you wouldn't want to block out. So book blurbs, I want kids to read book blurbs all the time. Um, comments from other authors, I want kids to have access to that too. So um, I'm a little type A also, I didn't want anything to block out. So I put them on um, the barcodes, you can decide. But this really helps you to make sure that the books go back in the unit that you're teaching. The other thing is, and this is teacher preference, I want the books available for kids. Generally, after you read them, what do they want to do? They, when they can't wait to read them. So wherever you have writing tools in your classroom, it's probably a good idea for you to prominently display the mentor text, not just from this unit, but even other books that you use. There are some teachers that put library card pockets in the back of their mentor text for upper grade. And they might include like a little index card and it says this book is really good for. And so it almost helps to code your books for certain craft techniques that you might want students to use when they go off and write independently. In the younger grades, we might take some pictures of certain pages in books and then create charts like Elephant and Piggy uses speech bubbles for dialogue. And so that kind of activates the schema of kids. Oh, these books are really good for me if I want to use speech bubbles. Or Cynthia Ryland uses the power of three. So I might take a picture of that page and activate the kid's schema. They see the front of the book. Oh, I could go read some Cynthia Ryland books. I might use the power of three. Yes. Janine, do we have these now at the school? Yes, they're at the schools. One shipment that came already is in your building. The other shipment I sent to Brian McMahon, and I need to go over there in the storage area and um, unpack, repack, label, and get them shipped to you. Okay. So um, not everything is in the building, but most. So we should look for it then in the building. Go to the secretary and see if it's. I notified your school that they were coming and just leave them until okay. you all had your hands on them. Okay. Thanks. Do you think most of these mentor texts we ha already have? several websites that you can just read the digital copy of the text and put it up on your smart board. Okay. The other thing I will say is that a couple of principals did reach out and they're looking into purchasing school-wide and selling the kits, um, the mentor text if you need extra copies of them. Okay. Just because we share. If we have five logistics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So one thing that you might want to consider, I'm ignoring what's on this right now, I'm trying to give you some practical information, is the first five lessons on all of your units that's called immersion. 
you wanted to think of like a, a barbecue word, I'm gonna say marinating. And if you all don't start exactly on the same day, it actually might be more doable to share the mentor text. So I don't know if your curriculum map dictates that you all start on the same exact day, but you could almost like, I'm gonna start this book on Monday, I'm gonna start this book on Tuesday, because in how writers work, those books don't necessarily have to be taught sequentially. It's not until you get to the mini lessons and the stages of the writing process where you have to honor the process. But when you're in immersion, you know, if you sit down with your grade level colleagues and kind of decide, I'm gonna use this mentor text on this day to support turn and talk. I'm gonna use this mentor text on this day because it's mostly talking about routines and structures. You're using them for two purposes in the first unit. In the second unit, probably not as much because it's very, very connected to the, to the text type. Um, generally, when you think about how we select books, we do use something called the publisher's criteria, but there are three categories of books. And so, things that you can do to get your colleagues ready. That first slide where we mentioned purpose, audience, reading like a writer, structure, routines, that's very important. In the front matter of the unit, the first 15 to 17 pages before the lessons start, there are some pages where you're just like, skip, 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 like the one that has a big giant C and it talks about the standard. You know that the unit is aligned. When you get to the page that has introduction, why am I teaching this unit, and what are the outcomes, this page is very important. If I was going to meet with colleagues, I'd probably say three things in the binder are really important for them to look at first. So in the spirit of time, I'm trying to present this, but then also give some suggestions of what you can share with colleagues. The first thing is this page. This is in the front matter, and it says student outcomes and why am I teaching this unit? Teachers always want to know the why. The second thing, just so you can see it, is something that's called an overview, also found in the front matter with the watermark overview, and it's a four-page document that is almost like the equivalent to a scope and sequence. It gives you the lay of the land. What are the lessons that I'm teaching? What are the books that I'm using in these lessons? What is the teaching point or the rationale? And what standards do these lessons uncover? So first thing is this, the introduction page. Second is the overview. And ironically, the third thing that I'm going to ask you to talk to your colleagues about is found at the end of the unit. I'm not gonna flip forward that many slides, but when you are in the end of the unit, there's something called a student performance checklist. And you're going to gently encourage all of your colleagues to take that checklist and move it from the back to the front. Because if you're a backwards design person, you wanna know, so where's this journey going to take me? That student performance checklist is giving you all your teaching points for every stage of the writing process. So when you see it, and I will pull up an example, it's not meant for teachers to take copious notes for every student for every lesson. But it is meant, some teachers actually use that as almost like the table of contents in their conferring binder. If I'm going to have conversations with kids about certain stages of the writing process, maybe these things on the checklist help me with that conversation. Um, it's very important for you to say though, they don't have to write a note down for every single thing because that would feel very, very heavy. So those three documents in the binder are really going to help teachers in preparation. It's like the what, why, and how. What is this? Why am I teaching it? How am I going to deliver that instruction? So the way that these units are built is the first word or the first type of lesson that you're going to experience is called immersion. These are the interactive read aloud lessons that we wrote for the purpose of either modeling craft, modeling structure, or modeling ideas. And if I added one more thing to how writers work, it's you're doing this while establishing routines and rituals. So in your first unit, the glue that kind of holds these, string, these things together are rituals, 
when you reach your second unit, you're going to have all these things in place. I'm, I'm a glass half full girl, so I'm always going to say that, right? All these things are going to be in place, and your workshop is running really, really well. Um, that's when you'll notice that the first five lessons, your interactive read aloud experience, you are marinating students in different craft techniques, in different structure. How is my piece going to go? What choices do I have available to me? Or to inspire students for some possible writing ideas. And this work was all done by Katie Woodray and Lester Laminick and Kelly Gallagher. If any one of those three walked in the door right now and you said to them, so how do you pick out those mentor texts to support writing instruction? They would say, we think about craft, we think about structure, and we think about ideas. Of these three, if you just stopped and reflected right now on yourself, which one feels really comfortable? Like, woohoo, I, I, I use books like this all the time. What's your area of comfort? So it's good to, to like, let's go to celebrations first. I feel really good about Ideas. That, that actually is usually the answer that I hear. Um, we use books to help activate some thinking in the students' minds of possible things that they're making connections to or things that they're passionate about or things that they're even interested in learning more about. So children pick up on this. I'm going to say to you that children and sometimes adults don't necessarily pick up on this. So my magical dream that one day it's going to happen, that when we start to teach those drafting mini lessons, I actually hear kids whisper, I wonder which text structure we want to use. Yeah. Wouldn't that be magical? And I, I, I want students to connect drafting with how is my story going to go? Which text structure, or plural, which text structures am I going to use? And this is the one that I find in my work that teachers have less schema for. And I'm not saying you in this room, but if you think about a progression of structures, starting, I'm pointing at you because you're in kindergarten. Um, kindergarten, the first two structures that we introduce them to are the list structure and the repeating pattern seesaw structure. So when I say brown bear, brown bear, you all say? What do you see, right? And all kindergarten students say? With, yes, so they get how those books go. Most of the books that you're reading aloud to kindergarten friends are list books. There's no chronology. There's no sequence. And so when you think about structure in terms of progressions, which is really how your um, maps are articulated to you, we know that in kindergarten it's possible for them to produce a list book, things that make you happy, sprinkles, and we know that they can pick up on the repeating pattern books. So some of those books are like question and answer books or brown bear, brown bear books. So right off the bat, kindergarten teachers can have a bunch of those little staple uh, booklets and the kids will emulate those types of structure. It's when we move from there that it gets a little more complex because then we introduce chronology. We introduce the words beginning, middle, and end to little five-year-olds who sometimes when they tell us a story, we have to figure out, did that happen yesterday? Is that happening tomorrow? You know, their sense of sequence might be off a little bit. So we use the words beginning, middle, and end. At some point, we introduce chronology. We get to first grade and we're like, go chronology and narrative writing. We got this. But then sometimes you read books to kids that are circular. So now you're a very prolific, proficient writer in first grade who doesn't say to you, you know what, I got this whole chronology thing down, I want to do something different. I want to do a circle story because I just read a circle, you just read me a circle story. Well, there's another structure that you've just given to your narrative writer. Um, or the first grader might say, I want to go back to like when I was in kindergarten and use the seesaw structure. So drafting is not formulaic. It's not, if I use my schema, it's not like in fifth grade I have the hamburger on the wall and I'm gonna write that five paragraph essay. Anyone else have that? <laughs> yeah. So that's not what writing process is. Writing process is giving children a menu of possibilities of how is my story or how is my book or how is my information going to go. An example might be opinion writing or persuasive writing could be letters. It doesn't have to be this way. So many of your books and many of your exemplars in your units will model for children all the possibilities
may say something like, as a reader of a biography, I can expect to encounter this book to be organized chronologically. And I know that because there are temporal words and phrases that help to show the passage of time. That's also my magical scenario, right? Um, you want children to be so well-versed in genre that it creeps on over to their writing life. So anything that I see and notice as a reader, I get to emulate and practice and do as a writer. So I'm gonna officially stop talking for two minutes right now. I want you to turn and talk at, at this table about anything that you heard before I asked for affirmation and celebration, something that you heard that might have given you like pause to say, oh, I never thought of it that way. Go. <laughs>
off today by saying you're shifting from ing to er mm -hmm. you're not assigning writing you're developing writers you also have to decide philosophically where grammar and conventions fix which means and i'm going to just like i'm going to leave some things hanging in the air for a little bit and then we'll revisit it you have to be in your mind thinking about what does editing mean to you and what does a published piece mean to you and so Sometimes I arrive in a school district and I, that's one of the first things I say, what is a published piece? And the teachers will not make eye contact with me. <laughs> and because they work in a place where it means perfect. It means nothing in the hallway can have anything wrong with it. And I philosophically, I don't align with that, but I have to be respectful of the philosophy then and the vision of the district. I work in some places that use daily oral language where it's in isolation and it's completely separate from reading and writing. I don't align with that either. So when I, what I say to you, I preface it with philosophically, the district probably has an, a vision of how grammar and convention is a part of, is a complement to your readers and writers workshop, but not living out in, I guess this is left field, wherever, whichever direction, in left field. I did? So when you have okay. the mentor text and you were doing read aloud, you will say to them, hey, look what Mo did. Mo used the subject of the sentence, but not at the beginning of the sentence. Mo put the subject over here so that when you are writing, right, you say to them, hmm, let's take a look, and this might be something that's a little different during that individual conference. Let's take a look at the, 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 the way you vary your sentence structure. I notice that you're using the subject of the sentence first. Let's try varying that by taking the sentence. Let's try and put the subject somewhere else. That's the purpose. It's for revision. So that's how we, that's our philosophy of how we want to make sure we're embedding it through yes. the readers and the writers' opportunity. So the power of mentor text yeah. is not just for craft. Mm -hmm. It's for noticing decisions that writers make to convey clear meaning. So going back to my initial, what's your definition of editing? If your definition is fix, that doesn't align with process. If your definition is more conveying clear meaning, like a first grader decided to use the word magnificent instead of good, we're so excited that they use the word magnificent, we're not gonna be like, now spell that word 100% correctly all the time. If there's some place in the classroom where they can retrieve that from, then might, that might be an expectation, but you have to make sure, not only that your students are clear on this, but also your parents. When I was a principal, some of my phone calls at the beginning of the school year were as a result of me not being crystal clear about what writing process meant, and even what the classrooms might look like. So an example is a parent called me up and said, you put my child in the worst classroom, there's nothing hanging up on the walls, it's just all this chart paper. Now in my mind, I'm like, awesome, you won the lotto. But I did, I did not express that well. As the building principal, I needed to say, classroom environments are going to look differently with writer's workshop because you're co-creating things with students in the now. It might not be all the pretty things from the teacher store or it not, might not be as many things from the teacher store or these days Pinterest with all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with defining stages of the writing process and when you get to editing, you know some of your families have schema for red pen, correct, fix. You have to philosophically describe what it is you want your young writers to think about and do across revision and editing. Even model through a mentor text how you can have children emulate craft and structure, but also decisions under grammar and conventions. So your, your picture books, your mentor text will really, really serve you well, just as pieces of student 
revisit it for a minute, some of the brain research that we have. Um, you know, this idea of moving everything into a keyboarding environment, and just because as adults we start to work in that environment, the actually we know the brain development and the tactile work of writing for young children's brain development is very important. And to take that away from them and to move them to keyboard too quickly actually does, will work against us long term. What would so, you recommend then? Like, what should there be? Should it be a gradual incorporation of? Because I'm coming down from a fifth grade too. Sure. So sure. would it be a gradual implementation of keyboarding, or would you just stay away from it? So in every, general, everything's on a continuum of support, right? Yeah. This is how we do. And so just like I look around the table today and I see this wonderful variation about how you make sense of work, right? I see written work, I see pictures, I see drawings, I see note taking, I see people keyboarding, right? There's a comfort level. Your children haven't developed their affinity yet, right? So collaborative work, we want to have written writing in front of us. We want to be able to both have pen to pencil. We want to be able to craft. We want a lot of experiences like that. Um, at some point, there'll be a piece that we may want to work towards that's now going to be in a PowerPoint version or it's going to be typed or it's going to be keyboarded. And typically, that's not in the development stage. That's more in the product stage. The publishing. Okay, so that's where you'll start to make that transition. Now, when a student says to me, you know, I really want to think about this on a computer, when they get that sophisticated, we'll start to build that into the program. But there's a lot of work that happens here before we're going to get there. Does that make sense? What it does. It okay. does. Because it's, again, we know that children need this as part of their brain work. Right? And some so children may want to publish yeah. a, a type of piece. So maybe at that point, they transfer it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to get used to this as well. I'm trying to figure out how to Is put this these real worlds. It's question. my first year in third. I usually don't allow them to uh, publish a type piece until at least mid-year. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's, it's always just an option for them. And I know they're purpose. not proficient yet at yeah. typing either, so it's, it's building that proficiency and then getting them to also think and translate that and directly to a computer. Too. And thinking about publishing, you know, there's different thoughts of, out there about publishing. It's not to make it perfect. It's not to make it so presentable, right? Um, so you got to think about purpose. Okay. So it may it's not be the best use of the time. Right. So connected to that conversation, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, is developmentally the concept of copying things over. And so this is like a continuum of conversations. And you have to really honor where children are, just like what we do in readers' workshop. I'm gonna tell a really quick anecdote, and then I'm gonna go back to this. Well, last week I had conversations, this is the third time, with second grade teachers about the efficacy of paragraph writing. And the teacher's like, they have to learn the paragraph, they have to learn the paragraph. And I said, well, give me your reading data. Thinking in my mind, there's not a strong purpose for 
Um, and and actually, there are some children who would, would I want to write about grandma today. I'm just not feeling it. So you have to build in those structures of calming writing muscles in my folder and my notebook, and I can take it outside, and I can see things in the world, and I can, you know, when you teach how to write long off of a post-it in leaders' workshop, it's the same thing. It's elaboration. We take something off the list. We develop an entry. We write long off of a post-it. So. I just said a lot in a small amount of time. I just, uh, one of the things that um, we had set up with our parents is our PTA had established in our school publishing center. Maybe you guys have that. Yeah. So if I'm a first grader and I'm really proud of my piece, I would take my piece that I've handwritten, has been edited and drafted, I'd cut it apart. I'd said, I want this on page one, this on page two, this on page three. Our parent, they meet with a parent publisher, they type it for them, they lay it back, the child edits their work, they then do their illustrations to it and they publish their piece. And what that, it, it creates this real understanding about publishing, and it takes away some of the monotony of the copy over, yeah. right, kind of piece. Because we still want that celebration. We also found some of the best editing happened when their piece that they wrote was converted, because the parents are instructed to type exactly as written, right? This is what you gave the publisher, yeah. right? So you've got to go back in and make those fixes. Very kind of, and a great, great way to involve parents in our conversation, yeah. right? So back in the day, I had a publishing center too, where because that was when we had discs and everything, we could save everything, and we had the, we went to the wallpaper stores to yeah. make the covers, yes. and then, yeah. so and we had the whole publishing center. And then when I became a principal, one of the things that I I really wanted to honor is, a, and you can bring this back to your principals if you want, but a wall of the library. I cleared all the shelves, and the published pieces we we swapped out every month a different grade level. And their pieces were housed in the library just like books because the kids were perceiving the books that were housed in the library as superhuman writers, super duper, and they didn't look at themselves. So we had all of the, the second grade writing on the wall, and then we left little pockets underneath, and kids could leave compliment post-its. And so we talked, we taught into how to leave a compliment. So it wasn't like good job, wink, wink. It was like I love the way you use sensory details. It was related to the teaching. And so when you can have that culture being cultivated in your schools so that children perceive the published books in the school library as valuable and important as the published pieces that they did, that's such a powerful message. Mm -hmm. And so um, now you can all go back and the principals are gonna say, who's this crazy person that just said I need a new wall? But, um, it's, it's a really nice experience. You can also do it digitally. You have a website, you know, you could be sharing and then kids could be commenting on each other's writing, but it is a way to, to have that sustained feeling of cultivating writers in your building. The National Day on Writing is October 20th. Just so everyone's aware, that will be an option for your building. We wanted to make sure that we as a district are participating more in competitions and events, and, and that would be a really nice way to highlight the work that 
writing is not linear. Writing could be, I write up the side of the page. Writing could be, I have a, a, a visual source here or a chart here and writing here. So if they are typing, you still need to give them the opportunity to leave space to either illustrate on the page or fold in some visual sources. Well, that's what they do. They'll fold, fold pictures from the internet, put that. it in. So not not that. That. <laughs> but they also do other activities where they're, I mean, Action writing. Yes, and they, they do Newsletter other activities public. where they are actually using pen, marker, colored pencil, but that digital piece for producing work and researching, you know, but that's also a shift for me that I got to think about yeah. now because I'm yeah. in third grade. For I'm just so them. used to getting them ready for what they need right. to do for middle school and moving forward. So my message is not don't use the computer. My message is purpose, audience, my purpose, who's my audience, and who are my students, and what's their learning profile. And sometimes they're going to choose a topic that needs to be this, because they've chosen to, you know, it's, it's just it's just who they are. And it should be messy. And it, workshop teaching is messy. That, I should have started with that. That's mm -hmm. bleeding. This is like not a neat and tidy um, instructional model. It's very messy, because I would love to tell you that just because you're teaching a revision lesson, that all children are on the messy part of workshop. You don't have that guarantee because it's writing is a process and everyone, you try to move kids along, but it's not so neat and tidy. I'm gonna send you paper choices mm -hmm. as well. Oh, well specifically yeah. for the younger kids, but I have uh, several examples of what you can offer the teachers. And you'll get some in the units as well. And um, paper choice is a gift. Yeah. Like I, when you walk into the classroom and do you all write alongside your students? So if you're teaching personal narrative, you're also writing a personal mm -hmm. narrative? Yeah. So if you currently aren't doing that, and that's gonna be something new to your repertoire, it's really important for kids to see you writing in younger grades, large, um, and, and to see your process. Like, how do I think aloud? How do I revise? And so your whatever text type you're teaching, you're also producing alongside your students. Mm -hmm. And they'll really appreciate that. But then you go over to the paper choice, wherever you have that, by your writing tools, and you say, hmm, and you like, you cut open your head and you make your thinking visible to all kids. I think I want to use this because I'm gonna have a layout of a two-page spread. You know, that's a word that you would use with your kids. Or I think I'm gonna use this kind of paper because I know that the illustration is gonna complement my writing and my audience is really gonna benefit from that. The academic language that you use will be really important for your kids in the decision-making. Because you know you have some kids that are waiting for you to say, 
sends things across buildings. You're all really going to be working together as a community of writing teachers. Um, so share any pieces, drafts, and published pieces. Because the way that you see the most growth, the way that we glean formative assessment data is to see how the piece changed from the draft to the published piece. Sometimes when kids get to see that, they're like, I am so awesome, look what I did. Like you want them to think about the additions to their pieces. So save both. For me, the draft is actually more authentic. And then the published piece sees, lets me know if my teaching stuck. So the draft is mostly from the student. The published piece is the benefit of you teaching into revision and editing. So then you can like reflect on your own teaching as well. So really quickly, really quickly, um, here is an example of a teacher who has writing tools, but also like labeled writing tools. And you will have access to this PowerPoint along with something else that I'll talk about at the end of this that has videos embedded in it too. So in the comfort of your own home, you can watch some videos. This teacher very organized. Is it hard to see with the light? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Better? Yeah. All right. Um, this teacher, paper choice, thesaurus, dictionary, highlighters, sticky notes, crayons, glue sticks. Um, some teachers use different colors to revise and edit, and so this is just an organization of that. A writer's notebook. So you should know, but this is a conversation that will be ongoing, that in how writers work, the introduction using Ralph Fletcher's work of the writer's notebook is in second grade. But sometimes in second grade, that's like the, the bubble year, where at the beginning of second grade, there's still, where's my second grade teacher? There's still like first graders a little bit, right? Yeah. So developmentally, we might choose to hold off on using the notebook then because they're still in the land of the folder. Maybe you have some fine motor things going on. So some second grade teachers opt to wait until the middle of the year to introduce the notebook. There is no one way is the highway. You're gonna decide when is it right to introduce the notebook. What's more important is that the kids know what the notebook is for, because we do not draft in the notebook. We also have to decide if we're gonna have a digital notebook or a thing. Um, the notebook is used for generating, so brainstorming, selecting, like which one am I going to choose, collecting the research that I do, and developing entries. It's not for drafting. We do not draft in a notebook. So when you introduce the writer's notebook, you also introduce coming out of the notebook into a drafting folder because that allows children to envision layout. My friends in K and one, this is not related to you because from an executive functioning lens, that would be way too much information. You use this for this, you use this for this. So I'll show you some examples of folders, but you do want to talk about personalizing your notebook brought mine along. Notice I didn't say decorating. Back in the day when you went to TC, they used the word decorating, and so I did too. And then I realized that sometimes what happens when you use the word decorating is it becomes the latest and greatest best art project, but it's not meaningful for students. So now I've kind of transitioned to the oral rehearsal and the oral storytelling related to writing. And I might have students, instead of gluing, gluing, gluing first, this is also for Kane Lab. They practice oral storytelling. So they bring in a Ziploc bag of artifacts, or if students don't have access to them at home, you might just put baskets of clip art, clip art and candy wrappers around the room. And you practice almost like things are going to support me as a writer. So I go through my Ziploc bag, and I'm like, so the reason why I choose tea is because I can't imagine starting my day without a cup of tea. But when I travel, the hotels all have that fancy kind of tea and I just want Lipton. Like I'll tell the kids that story. Or here's a New York Mets ticket. They're not doing so great this year though. And I'll say, this is the ticket of the first time that I went to the new City Field when they switched the name from Shea Stadium into City Field. And, but then I'll tuck something 
you told people put all the stuff in the wrong place and it really like That's it so made funny. me think like you know what a lot of the things that I put up in the classroom that was through my eyes I needed to learn my students about my students you were gonna say something yes because I'm not quite where you are yet and so now I can't let go of that yet but what I do do <laughs>
years work is light on that. There are not multiple stages of the writing process. And I'm gonna sound like a broken record, I'm gonna keep saying that, but that's because that unit is less about the published piece and more about establishing routines, rituals, expectations, and structure. So before I talk about going public, these, these are upper grades. Do you see this? Like these are the students' names, they're the authors. These are the topics they're going to write about. Um, this is just a list of topics with sticky notes. These teachers both hung them outside their door so that everyone in the world can see the topics that might be published in that classroom. Again, reluctant writers would so benefit from a colleague that you promise to buy coffee for for the next month if they come in and talk <laughs> to some of your reluctant writers about their topics. Because you know those kids that just can't get going? Like the, I don't, I don't have anything to say, or the I'm done kids, you know those kids, right? <laughs> the I'm done kids. You can prevent them from saying I'm done by inviting someone else. That's, that's like a really nice form of research. Here's like a little gentle suggestion. This is not in the unit, but do you know at the beginning of the year, we can actually ghostbuster some things? Yeah, but they're not important. Mm -hmm. Some things that we don't want to have happening in our workshop, like the word the end at the end of my narrative. Mm -hmm. So I put it out there. I say it before I even start teaching. Boys and girls, I'm so excited. We're going to be in this personal narrative unit. We're going to learn from mental authors. We're going to learn about sensory details and rich language choices. But here are the things we're not going to be including. I make it crystal clear. We are not going to end our stories with the words, the end. I hope you like my story. It was all just a dream. And then I went to bed. <laughs> Like, I literally, I say it tongue in cheek, but I'm actually very serious. Why do we wait until we see it? Just tell them at the beginning and create an anchor chart. It's not an engage, it doesn't leave the reader with something to wonder about. It doesn't leave the reader with an emotive reaction. Um, so anything you don't want happening in your unit of study, developmentally appropriate, put it out into the world. Just let them know. The words, I'm done. I, I had an anchor chart that said what to do when we get stuck and what to do when we think we're done. And then I said, we're never uttering those words again. Launch, we were allowed, we got it out of our system, shake it out, I'm done, I don't have anything to write about, and then that was it. So you have to decide, like, in fifth grade, you could tell a fifth grader, no, we're done with the end. Mm -hmm. And you could say it with love and with humor, but whatever you don't want to see happening, you need to kind of let the kids know. Kids not only crave structure, they, they want clarity. They don't say that to you. But if you tell a kid you can't use the word the end, they're gonna be selling each other out. <laughs> author posters. So here are some examples of author posters in how writers work. There's going to be an anchor, like a, a sample appendix that tells you some tips on how to create an author poster. And, and it's in all grade levels. In the units, we also give you some websites of some authors who we know offer really good information for students about what inspired them to be a writer, what's their purpose. Teachers can create these, but in certain grade levels, turn it over to the kids. But you don't wanna be the one that creates it. Let them do the research on the author, depending on the grade level that you teach. So <coughs> if you go to Gail Gibbons' website, she's one of the best ones, actually. She's a study her in second grade, but when you interview Gail Gibbons and you say to her, so what's your purpose? Why do you write? You know what she says? She says to honor the curiosity of her readers. I love that. She doesn't say to teach. She doesn't say inform. She doesn't say persuade. She doesn't say entertain. Don't use those words, by the way. She, you want to dig deeper. Uh, she says to honor the curiosity of her readers, and that's where fun facts were born. You know how she has those fun facts? She says, I'm more interested in the kid that wants to know how long the giraffe's tongue is, as opposed to where does the giraffes live, what do they eat, what do they look like? Because can you almost predict what it was all about books? She's like, no, no, no. I want kids to be like, be curious. How long is the tongue? Why do they have those spots? Like that's the stuff that's going to engage the audience. So on her website, she says this out loud, and then there's a video of she and her husband walking in the woods in Vermont, and she's like, oh, I wonder how sap turns into syrup. 
she was so curious about that that she and her husband started the syrup company. So she like practices what she preaches. She honored her own curiosity about Seth, and now she makes syrup too, besides being a prolific author. Um, you will find tidbits of information about authors that will resonate with some of your kids, especially about what inspired them. Cynthia Rylant tells kids, my two favorite things to do are walking my dog, which now makes her human, and going to the movies at two o'clock and crunching all popcorn so that I can hear my own self crunch, because not too many people go to the movies at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. She's like a real person. It's almost like you have to demystify the superhero-ness of these venture authors. So these author posters, it's mentioned in the first unit. I would advocate for doing it across the whole year. Choose an author for each text type. If you're in an older grade, you could choose multiple authors and let them become the researchers about these authors. And then here's just some other charts on writer's notebooks, what do writers write about. And then here's some examples of craft charts. Now, when I have the lovely benefit of spending the entire day with you, part of it would be very experiential. And you would be creating craft charts off of at least one of your mentor texts. So one thing that I would suggest to all of you as the turnkeyers um, is my idea of a rockin' Friday night, which really speaks to I need a life, um, would be to go through a mentor text with a friend, maybe with a glass of wine, I don't know, and say, what did you notice? And what did you notice? And then all of a sudden, we're unpacking a book through the lens of craft techniques and structure, because that's going to help inform my teaching. So what it doesn't say in your interactive read aloud lessons on the fly. You just can't do it. You have to practice reading like a writer. You have to look at the lesson and see what the rationale is. The good news, and this is really good news, is that we've written the lessons in two different fonts. It's regular font and italicized font. It represents what you do, where do I put my sticky notes, and what you say. Not meant to be read like a script and your personality, but at a minimum, if you have teachers who are not feeling comfortable and confident with craft, the italicized font tells them exactly where they're going to stop and model for craft techniques. So there's no mystery here. We don't just hand you 10 books and say, have at it. Good luck. We're actually saying, you know, you might want to stop up on page 13. Many picture books don't have page numbers, so we describe the scene that's happening on that page. So in the spirit of being planful, especially with your immersion lessons, the first five lessons, reading like a writer, reading those five rationales and teaching points, taking sticky notes and putting them across the mentor text, that is critical. So you are all going to champion for what? And the phrase, what? Reading like a writer. Reading like a writer, yes. Those two things will be gifts that you could give to your teachers regardless of the resource that you use. This is not school-wide specific, this is just best practice. Like in order for my kids to fill their toolbox, I need to show them tools. Then the kids are gonna decide when they're ready to use that tool. So a craft chart is an opportunity for you to literally take a picture of the cover of the book, Puddles, that might go in the middle, <coughs> And the craft chart doesn't have to be fancy. It could literally be bubbles coming out the side. And you're charting your noticings. It's a great word in writer's workshop. So you might have some noticings with 
So I show this because I love this. When the teacher decided to put up published pieces, she used a two pocket folder. She put photographs of the authors and she clipped every piece of work. So it wasn't just the ta-da published piece. It was every single thing behind it that contributes and honored the process. And so when you, when you think about publishing celebrations and publishing parties, we generally think about the, the thing at the end. I, especially with parents, I want them to see like the, the effort that was put forth for the kids to get to that moment in time. So I love that the teacher included all of that. This is just really efficient, it's two pocket folders. And then all year, she just pops them in and out. So, what we're not going to get to today, so we, uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, is this concept of reading like a writer, going through mentor texts, putting sticky notes in them, and charting them. I am going to quickly model some of that through mentor texts. All of these things you have access to in a packet and on Fundamentals Unlimited. I'm not sure, I didn't see the kickoff packet in here, but I'll send that to you. And in it is like all of this information. So anything that you see on the slides, this is the equivalent of your craft cheat sheet, I'm going to say. What is it that I think about and do and I get ready to put sticky notes across my mentor texts? And you're going to get to know the books through the eyes of craft techniques. So if I pick up our tree named Steve, one of my third grade teachers, this is in your third grade How Writers Work unit. And this gentleman who wrote this book is also a writer for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and so um, when you read the book, you're gonna be surprised because it's not comedic. But to give you some schema for this book, this is written during the time of Superstore and Candy. And the children, when they went to pick out a plot of land to build a house, a plot of land that had this tree on it, but the little girl couldn't pronounce tree, and she called it Steve. And so that's where the title came from. And so this is an authentic purpose. When I introduced this book, I'm like, this really happened. And the way that he wrote this, and this actually happened in his life, is he first started out with a letter. And so the technical term, and I don't care that kids know this, is epistolary, so when we're writing letters, and it says, dear kids, a long time ago when you were too little, mom and I small group for the kids who are ready to use the ellipse 
<laughs> and so sometimes in younger classes, we do just read the story first, and then we revisit for our craft notices. You decide that based on your kids. But as we're going through this book, here, we put a swing on the tree. Something happens. I'm flashing forward a little bit. We take pictures under the tree. And though, and so now, we get to this point, which brings me to the point of this letter. Last week, a storm hit our area. And though we spared Steve, you see what happened? I, I do cry when I read this book, so I'm doing this very quickly without crying. But, um, we spared Steve's life a long time ago, but this time we just couldn't save him. Now look at the colors. You see the sad dog? It says, are we sad? Sure we are. But even in his final moments, when he could have fallen on top of our house, when he could have fallen on top of Sarah's swings, Kirby's house, or Mom's garden, Steve performed his last trick and protected all of us to the very end. And friends like this are hard to find. So when you come home from Grandma's next week, Steve will not be able to greet you, as he's done for all these years in the past. But please know that Steve will always be with us in our hearts, in our thoughts, and in a different tree in the other end of our backyard. They used the wood from the tree to build the tree house, which you can't see in the illustration. So this lives in a narrative unit. It uses letter, uh, it's narrative, but it's using letter form or a series of snapshots a la two page spreads. Um, it has a sense of chronology, but, but almost like a memoir. It's almost like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm recalling back. It's very reflective. The language and the use of pause punctuation, there's an ellipse at the end of almost every two-page spread. Um, there's commas in, in a series in this book. We're not going to stop and notice all of that with third graders. So the lesson will guide you, but your instincts about your students will also guide you as well. And so when we selected this book, we selected it for a series of reasons. It's a very different approach to a narrative piece, but it's effective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not all children would say, ooh, it's like a photo album, a series of snapshots along the way. Um, but you're going to say that, right? Um, so that was a very quick version of just stopping and noticing things. Now, this is in the first grade unit. The first thing I say to kids is, look at the decision they made for the title. The, the letters of the word puddle look like it's like water, right? And in this particular book, it starts out with muted colors because we're in the storm. And when we read like a writer and we see a word like this, the intonation and expression on the second syllable, we don't say kaboom. We say kaboom because we're reading like a writer. But when the storm stops and we get to a page that says, I love this page, in the, in the morning it does, like a curtain rising on a shiny new day. A day of brightness and blue, a sky wiped clean of the last cloud. Show, don't tell. I didn't say the storm is over. That would have been really easy. Instead, I said a sky wiped clean of the last cloud. And so maybe I don't use this with all my students because it's figurative language, but I do have some friends who are ready for it. What all kids are ready for is the detail on the illustration, the tongue sticking out of this little girl's mouth. You know when kids work really hard at something, what do they do? So this little girl is working really hard to get her boots out, because what does she want to do? She wants to go outside and yeah. jump in puddles. This page is repeated at the end of the book. So the kids pick up on that this is almost like a circular story, that they start out the day jumping in puddles, and they end their day jumping in puddles. So there are multiple structures in this book. There's a sense of chronology, a sense of beginning, middle, and end but there's also a repeating scene. And when you when you bring that up to kids, like 23 out of 25 of your first graders are like, oh, that's a big deal. Two of them are like, oh, that's kind of cool. I think I want to try that out. So you adjust your noticings. This page has alliterate, I'm sorry, onomatopoeia 
EM, and then dash. It's a form of pause punctuation. Anytime you pick up a picture book, you're going to see them. It's like twice the width of a regular dash. It falls into the category of pause punctuation. It, it, it triggers the reader to stop for a moment and reflect. When you read like a writer, you notice that that's a decision. So you're front loading your lessons, and I'm gonna go to a lesson really fast. I promise to go back to all of these things. In immersion, them with children. You're figuring out what the genre and text type looks like and sounds like. You're discussing the purposes for writing and then you're thinking about possible topics because when you visually see what an interactive read aloud lesson looks like, you have the opportunity first, this is the first place your eyes are going to go for preparation, for rationale. This is my teaching point. If your colleagues are using Fundamentals Unlimited to access this, all of these sections have a different tab. So if I did a compare and contrast to digital access versus print access, print, your eyes are drawn here first. Digital, you click on the tab that says rationale. Your eyes next go to preparation. What is it that I need? Which book do I need? What kind of paper do I need? And is there a thing that complements the lesson. This is really important. Are you ready? It's going to be very prolific. This is not worksheet workshop. So there's a lot of things in this binder that complement every lesson. Please do not feel like you need to camp out at a copy machine and make copies of all of those things. Sometimes they're mock-ups of anchor charts. This is the information you might want to include on the elements of a biography. Sometimes they're a graphic organizer. You certainly don't need to make 25 copies of a Venn diagram. Kids can create that themselves in their writer's notebook. So a lot of times it's just meant for you to think about some supports that you may or may not decide to use. But I would never want this to turn into a worksheet workshop. And, and you could appreciate that because what do we want kids to do during writing workshops? Right. Yeah. So rationale first, suggestions here. We have suggestions for children who are second language learners as well. So if you need some L supports, those are built into the units. And then the way the lesson is built, I always say, I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about how to do a read aloud because I believe all teachers were put on the planet to do what? Mm -hmm. To read to kids, right? I, I think one of the best parts of the day, or at least I hope it is, is when you get to read aloud to students. And so, there are certain things that you do before the read, there are certain things that you do during the read, and there are certain things that you do after the read. The lesson is a guide, it's not a script. That's, that's really important. Please tell your colleagues that we are not stripping them of their humor, of their instincts, of the way that they say things. This is a guide for them. And at the end of the lesson, you might see something that suggests a modification or differentiation for second language learners. By the way, some of these suggestions are good for any kids. So there might be an extra graphic organizer or there might be extra conferring prompts that you would use with those children who might need like a second look at something. Sometimes in How Writers Work, we remind you of a really good routine or ritual that you're folding into your workshop. And so that's also a category. And these pages are just called your transition to independent writing. So visually, the lesson usually fits on two pages. And if you have, because you're sharing the unit, and because I'm gonna go like this, no, 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 I know that you're gonna make copies. That's the reality. And you're each gonna take your copy and you're, some people are highlighters, some people are note takers. When you have the digital access, you also can highlight and there's a note icon. So there's a pencil icon and there's a highlight icon. Just like your students operate differently, we as adults all operate differently. So you will have options of both. When you transition to mini lessons, these are organized, so after, Immersion. Oops. See, I'm editing myself right now. That should be a parenthesis. Um, these are the words that we use to represent the stages of the writing process. And those are the very same words that are found on the tabs. So those words are these words. I skipped ahead. I'm looking up there. 
what words are used underneath. So I'm going to focus in on drafting. Drafting doesn't say rough copy or rough draft or sloppy copy. We don't use those, right? I think I said that. <laughs> Some teachers do use them, right? Yeah. We use words like plan, envision, and organize. You know the magical scenario I said before that when we get to drafting, I wish kids would say, I wonder what type of structure I'm going to use. Wouldn't that be cool? So drafting is first to inspire kids to think about how's your story going to go with the layout. Um, if you ever have a chance to invite an author to your school, they often will put their storyboard out with like Velcro. And it's like, it's almost like out loud. They're changing their mind and they're thinking about the order and the structure. So the words underneath here are as important as the stages of the writing process. And most of these are probably really familiar to you, yes? These are words that we use. So your mini lessons start after two weeks, even though there are five lessons in immersion, always, five read-alouds, I'm gonna say that you give yourself the gift of time. So we doubled it. Because sometimes in kindergarten, having them sit through a whole book at the beginning of the year would be like torture, right? So we're gonna stretch that book out. Some books deserve more time than others. So immersion is one to two weeks, and then you see a series of approximate days to take you through the unit. I'm gonna say in year one, all of these numbers are going to go higher, especially right here. I think this, this stage takes much less longer than two to four days. Mm -hmm. And it also depends on the frequency in which you're teaching writing. I know that your math said four to five days. I also know the reality of assembly, spire, dome, and other things that happen. So the words that we use semantically, and if you're a Lucy person, this is going to feel very, very similar to you. I'm going to go to the next slide are inform, present, engage, and reiterate. And I use consistent stems to introduce each part of the architecture of the mini lesson. Again, kids don't say this to you, but they, they really do benefit from consistency. So when I start my mini lessons, I always say, something like, so yesterday we worked on, and today as writers, we are going to. So that's my stem. I introduce the teaching point. And if I wanted to work on pacing, because truthfully, when I first became a workshop teacher, my mini lessons were maxi. Anyone else experience that? Maxi lessons? Mm -hmm. Like they go over 16 minutes? My principal once wrote that in my evaluation. I was a little upset about that. Because I thought, so when I became a principal, one of the things that I worked on was having teachers not just say to me, my mini lessons are maxi, but being able to identify which part of the lesson do I run long. So really like the sum of its pieces is the architecture of the mini lesson. So this part is the crisp statement of your teaching point and should likely never go over two minutes. If you really wanted to work on pacing, my inform these days is like 45 seconds. So I might say, today as writers of biographies, we're going to be working on noticing temporal words and phrases. Those words and phrases help me to understand the passage of time of the experiences of my subject. That's it. We're not checking for understanding, we're not elaborating, we're just, whatever your teaching point is, whatever the rationale is, that's basically what you're doing in inform. When I first graduated college a very long time ago, that wouldn't have flown because they told us that we had to check for understanding. Anyone else have that experience? It's like, so you tell me back what it is we're going to do, and you tell me back, but nope, because they had three more chances to get it across the mini lesson. The present part is AKA model. My stem is watch me as I show you how Jonathan London used zoom in shots of feet so that the reader could understand what these pages would be about. So my stem is watch me as I show you. Your stem doesn't have to be that, but I just like to be consistent with kids. And, and you know what that affords them? They know what your job is, and they know what their job is. So my job as the teacher 
<laughs> and then they take us to Storytelling Lane. Anyone ever go there? <laughs> so Storytelling Lane is a lovely place to go, isn't it? That's what makes our mini lessons next. Is the minute we go to Storytelling Lane, we have forgotten what our teaching plan is, and now we just lost 10 minutes of time that you could be writing. So I'm very dramatic. I teach young children the difference between on carpet and off carpet conversation. On carpet conversation is grounded in writer's workshop. It's not, I had spaghetti and meatballs for dinner. And do you know that like within a week, the kids are selling each other out? The minute they start to go to storytelling lane, they're like, like you don't have to use those words, but find, find a way to avoid storytelling lane because then we lose the essence of our teaching point, but we've also just taken time away from independent writing. So present, when I do demo lessons in the classroom, the teachers generally think that I'm avoiding their kids. They're like, you are, you're ignoring them because the hands are popping up and they're gonna start to shout things out. I do not call on them. I keep on going. I keep on going with the model. I mean, it's really hard and it does look like I'm, I'm ignoring them, but I'm just trying to stay true to the architecture. Probably six minutes is a good window for you to consider. Now here's where the release happens. So we, we went through the I do, right? Now we're in the we do. The engage could be something like, now I want you to give it a go, or now I want you to give it a try. And this is where turn and talk happens. Now I want you to give it a go. I'm gonna put up this illustration on the smart board or under the document camera, or I'm gonna give you each a piece of text where you turn and talk with your partner about, so if this lesson was temporal words and phrases, I'll pretend I'm holding a biography, about the special words that are used to describe how time passed during Abraham Lincoln's childhood. And so you're just setting them up to have a successful guided conversation. So partnerships happen in engage, you are bopping around, exercise, right, up, down, scooping up brilliance, all of that is happening, and then the kids share. And not all 25 are sharing, just a couple of kids are sharing, because this part also is about six minutes. So if you really wanted to adjust your pacing, it would be about two minutes, about six minutes, about six minutes, this generally goes a little bit longer, first because all kids want to share and then mini lessons are circular like the structure of a mini lesson reiterate is restating your teaching point so today as writers we learned how temporal words and phrases help the reader to understand the passage of time and this is where the toolbox might be a novel thing for you to use you could end your mini lesson by saying so boys and girls, up on, up on this chart, we have our narrative toolbox and you'll write temporal words and phrases. Are, are any of you ready to put that in your own toolbox? So maybe the toolbox is just a list in the back of your notebook, or maybe it is the milk carton. I use a binder ring with index cards and we're very like celebratory about we're ready to add another tool, but the end of the mini lesson could be children just stopping for a moment before they leave the gathering area and thinking to themselves, hmm, am I ready to put that in my toolbox? Because that is your goal for every lesson that you end with. The goal is the potential of giving them a something that they could try out. So reiterate, is, so today, boys and girls, we, we have another tool that's available to us as a biography writer, and that tool is called Temporal Words and Phrases. And that tool helps the reader so much. Do you see how I always say, helps the reader, helps the audience? then the reader can really figure out or envision the passage of time. So when you go off and write today, you have to really think about it. Is that a tool that you're ready to use? And maybe the answer is no. Just because you taught it doesn't mean all kids go and do it. That's the messy part of workshop. But you have the potential of filling your toolbox across the whole year. So visually, this lesson looks very similar. The rationale again, why am I teaching this, is in the upper right hand the what do I need, the preparation is right here. And then do you see how the font is changing? So remember I said the inform is short, even visually it looks short, right? The amount of text kind of is a signal to you, oh, I say less during this part. The amount of text in present grows longer because you're doing the modeling. And then I 
I get to engage, that's when kids are turning and talking. And then reiterate is also short because you're just wrapping it up. You're restating the teaching point. So those are the two kinds of lesson structures that live in your units. All units always start out with five consecutive read alouds called immersion. And then we pick up with mini lessons that adhere to the stages of the writing process, which is actually very similar to Lucy's units. Her booklets are organized by stages of the writing process. And the feedback that I get, and when I was a building administrator, is everyone is a different kind of learner and leader. And so some, some people who have schema for a writing process, they go through Lucy's units and they're like, I'm, I'm awesome. There are other teachers and they see this and they're like, oh, this is laid out in two pages. This is kind of cool. It's a little bit more doable. And then there are some that kind of fluctuate between the two. So not a script, a guide, pretty user friendly, change of font to represent what you do and what you say, and really nice suggestions of how to use the mentor text or anchor charts to support your teaching. That was literally me going Bleh, like this mm -hmm. because of that. So let me stop for a moment and turn this over to you. What are you thinking right now? My head's gonna explode all over the table. Um, no, I'm really excited. Excited. I'm excited. You're excited? I just wanna see it in front of me though. Yes. Yeah. So every binder looks like this with shrink wrap lessons, with tabs, and books. The best part of this will be the books. Mm -hmm. And there's one notebook per grade, right? For school. So the way that it's been explained to me is that you are sharing on grade levels, which is why the digital access is being extended, because digitally, you all have access to every unit of study. How, so, and by digital, you mean where are we Yeah, how do we get that? The school wide website. So, um, Stephanie's coming oh, cool. in in about 10 minutes. She's coming to you virtually <laughs> to give you a snapshot of Fundamentals Unlimited. And so it's not the website that you get the lessons from. It's a link that you're all going to get that brings you to a place that's almost like school-wide's version of the cloud. And if you could think about, you know when you go shopping on Amazon? Anyone after this happens to them? And you think you're only going to buy one thing and you get sucked into the abyss of Amazon and the next thing you do is you look at your shopping cart and there's 15 things in it. Fundamental, this is very important. Fundamentals Unlimited could be like an Amazon. I'm going to suggest to you that less is more. So you are in the writing lane, yes? When you go on Fundamentals Unlimited, you're going to see reading, you're going to see grammar, you're going to see guided reading, you're going to see assessment, you're going to see environment, you're going to see student examples of work, you'll see articles that I've written and my colleagues have written. Less is more. There are buckets that you will see on Fundamentals Unlimited. The bucket that you want to stay in first is units because that's going to be supportive to you in the now. So there's four kind of buckets that you're going to see. You want to stay in the bucket, it, it looks like a blue rectangle, of units. The only other one that I will invite you, because you're going to be curious, to go into is teacher resources, because that's where student writing is. Because you're curious, I'll tell you, the buckets are assessment, units, teacher resources, and the texts do not give you the mentor text, so I, I would love to tell you, 